children, you're dismissed to go downstairs. Everybody else, Jeremiah chapter 17 is where we're going to be today. Jeremiah chapter 17 is where we're going to be reading. The title of the uh, message is this, The Heart is Deceitful. The heart is deceitful. We're going to get into a very familiar verse that most of us are aware of, that's quoted often. Uh, But let's begin in verse number 1. Jeremiah 17, verse number 1. The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron and with the point of a diamond, and it is graven upon the table of their heart and upon the horns of your altars. Whilst their children remember their altars and their groves by the olive trees upon the high hills. O my mountain in the field, I will give thy substance and all thy treasures to the spoil and thy high places for sin throughout all thy borders. And thou, even thyself, shalt discontinue from thine heritage that I gave thee, and I will cause thee to serve thine enemies in the land which thou knowest not. For ye have kindled a fire in mine anger which shall burn forever. Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man and maketh his flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. For he shall be like the heath in the desert, and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land, and not inhabited. Blessed is the man that trusteth the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for the opportunity that we have today to open your word. We thank you for all that's happened already this morning. We thank you for the opportunity that you gave us in your presence to sing to you. And Lord, you are worthy of our song. You are worthy of our our praise. We do declare today that all our life you have been faithful. You've been so, so good, dear God. And Lord, I pray that in this hour we would recognize this word not as mine, but as yours. And Lord, I pray that this word would pierce our hearts, challenge us, convict us, and Lord, even change us. Help us to be like you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want you to think about what the Lord is saying in verse number one. The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron and with the point of a diamond, and it is graven on the table of your heart. He's speaking metaphorically here. He's talking about the mindset of the people. The people of Israel have gone full-blown into idolatry and rebellion. And the Lord calls them out on it. He says, your sin is written with a pen of iron. Think of the hardness of the sin of Judah. It's engraven on the table of your heart. Uh, That's only possible if their heart is hard like a stone. They're hard-hearted people here. Look at verse number two. As the Bible continues on, Jeremiah is preaching. He says, whilst their children remember their altars and their groves by the green trees upon the high hills. He says, your idolatry, the sinfulness of your decision-making is something that has transferred generationally. In other words, your children are making the same sinful decisions that you made. Now look at verse 3. He says, O my mountain in the field, I will give thy substance and all thy treasures to the spoil and thy high places for sin throughout all thy borders. And so it is almost as if the Lord is speaking to the land itself and he's saying how sad this is. And all of this was, I mean, it was to benefit the people. A land that flowed with milk and honey. The, the, the land that was lush and green. And, and yet uh, now, uh, sadly, God's people are being punished. Let's continue on in verse number four. The Bible says, uh, And thou, even thyself, shalt discontinue from thine heritage that I gave thee. And I will cause thee to serve thine enemies in the land which thou knowest not. For ye have kindled a fire in mine anger, which shall burn forever. And God is saying, I want you to look me in the eyes here. The word discontinue is a strong, strong word. God's purpose for his people was to be blessed continuously. And yet God is saying very shortly 
I'm going to discontinue you in the land that I gave you. And that's exactly what happens. We know of the captivity that they go into in a short time for 70 years. And so let's dive into, uh, I, I gave several, I wrote down several headers to help break up the text and to see it uh, clearly uh, this morning. The first one I wrote down is this, the arm of flesh will fail you. The arm of flesh will fail you. Maybe you heard that, that reference, that phrase, that lyric in a song before. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, in our life, a product will do well on the shelves, but then it's discontinued and not used anymore. Remember the first time you got uh, a cassette tape? Uh, and how cool that was, uh, that I got a cassette tape, I'm playing music, I can rewind it, I can fast forward it to my favorite song. Well, they're discontinued now. Uh, uh, think about your favorite TV series uh, that you never thought it was going to end. Uh, uh, there was a show when the, uh, the Mackenzie and Chloe and Kaylee were kids, uh, some of you may have heard of it, uh, it was called Good Luck Charlie. Did anybody ever hear of Good Luck Charlie? We loved Good Luck Charlie. And Good Luck Charlie, I mean, it was just so popular. But after three seasons, it was discontinued. It was unbelievable. And, and, and God is saying to his people, I'm going to discontinue you in the land that I have given you. Let's look again at verse number five. The Bible continues on. Thus saith the Lord, cursed be the man that trusteth a man and maketh flesh his arm and whose heart departeth from the Lord. Strong language, cursed be the man. God is saying, ultimately, you are inviting a curse upon your life when you are trusting in your own, own strength. Look at the end of verse 5. It says, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. Remember this, your heart departs from God long before your feet do. When people walk away from the Lord, it's because their heart has already turned on the Lord. It's important we understand that. Well, God is getting at the core here. The unseen, the part that he sees, not the part that others see. God is saying, I've seen your departure already from this land. Verse number six, for he shall be like the heath in the desert and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land not inhabited. This was like a desert shrub in the wilderness. Uh, it had fruit, but it wasn't edible. It looked good on the outside, but it was dry and fruitless on the inside. And that was picturing the people of God that had rejected God. And now look at the contrast in verse 7. The Bible says, Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is. And that is where the hope is. The hope is found in the Lord. The hope is not in government. The hope is not in the economy. The hope is not in wealth. Hope is in Jesus. It's found right there. Israel was in a bad place. Just as I could say, our world today is in a bad place. But the hope is only found in Jesus. Look at number 8. Uh, Jeremiah 17, verse number 8. For he shall be like a tree planted by the wa uh, waters that spreadeth out her roots by the river and shall not see when the heat cometh, but her leaf shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. And we see the contrast. The reminder is Psalm 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. The exact same uh, language here. Understand, the only way for you to be fruitful in life, the only way for you to be successful as life, uh, in life is found in the word of God. And it's important that we realize God is saying, abide in me. To know your Bible is to know God. It is impossible to know God apart from his word. That's our reasoning for preaching 
reading through the entire Bible because God wants us to see him. God wants us to know him. It's not my job to cherry pick cheerful passages that pump us up every single Sunday because there are times that we've got to preach through difficult books like Jeremiah Jeremiah, that remind us of sin, the consequences of sin, that sin's not a pet. It's not a toy. It's not a game. It is serious. And sin has real consequences. The arm of flesh will always fail us. It's not about us trying. It's not about us doing better. It's about God. To know God is to know his word. Number two, notice this, God sees the real you. God sees the real you. Just so we're all clear today, there's a church can and a real can. There's a church you and a real you. Say amen right there. We all see what we all see. But God sees what everybody else doesn't see. Say amen again right there. We need to understand that. Verse number 9. The Bible says, The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And this is a rhetorical question. The answer is nobody. Uh, uh, The answer is found in verse number 10. I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. And Jeremiah is talking about the sin of God's people, the judgment that's going to be coming. And again, the emphasis is on the heart. Samuel said it like this. Or God told Samuel, man looketh on the outward appearance, God looketh on the heart. In Jeremiah's day, their heart was rotten to the core. They had a heart issue. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. We've used this analogy before. That person that they go and they, they, they're pounding a nail and then they go and, they, and they, they hit their hammer and they accidentally hit their thumb and they, their thumb turns purple and then they begin to say all those words that Brother Oscar says. And, and, <laughs> And it's like, I didn't mean to say that. I just, that just came out. Do you know what comes out? What's inside? That when you're going through a tough time, and grace and mercy and patience flows from your heart, it's revealing the real you. Tough times just reveal what's already there. It's important we understand this. Jeremiah 3 says, the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. I'll never, ever, ever understand why people are more concerned in their credit report, people are more concerned in protecting their pin. People are more concerned in protecting the, 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 their, their status than they are protecting their own heart. We, we, I mean, we lock our doors at night. We lock our cars when we're at church. If I was, let me just go ahead and ask. If you drove to church today and you locked your car, raise your hand. My hand is up. No, we, we all did. Everybody that drove today, you locked. How many of you, before you left, you locked your heart, house or your apartment? Raise your hand. We all did. We put locks on everything. We guard it. We protect it. You know what? I mean, the reality is I've never in my 46 years of living ever had somebody break into my house and enter a window. Yet I've got every single one of my window locks. They're all locked. We lock, we protect everything. And yet how often do we not guard our heart? It's so important that we think about this. The Bible says God searches the heart. By the way, if we're not careful... Uh, we, we can do things with the wrong motive. I was in a church one time. There was a Sunday school teacher. He, he, didn't, he was getting ready to teach the kids a class. And I said, what are you getting ready to teach? And he said, I didn't prepare anything today. And he said, but we're going to have a great lesson. I said, well, what's your lesson about? He said, well, I got a $20 bill, and I'm going to give it to the kid that behaves the best. So, so uh, now, what that does is this. Somebody's going to walk away with a $20 bill. And is going to think a lot of the teacher. And they're not going to have a big view of Jesus. Now, I want you to think about this. If we're not careful, our motives can be in the wrong place. If we're not careful, we can serve the Lord and our motives are about us 
and not about others. It's important that we realize that, and this is going to kind of get into what I'm going to say next, that we do what we do for the Lord, not for others. David's prayer in Psalm 139 was, Lord, search my heart, try me, know my thoughts, see if there be any wicked way in me. It's important that we need God to search us. Uh, we, we need the word of God to do inventory in our hearts and in our lives. You know, in, in, uh, right now, the ground is saturated. saturated. And, and if you were to, to take a bunch of rain and, and allow the rain to go into this back corner of the building, it's going to filter its way all the way down and work its way through any crack in the foundation and find its way to the basement floor of this church building. That, that's just what it's going to do. It's going to, get, uh, it's going to go to a place that nothing else can get to. Understand, that's what the Lord does. He gets to a place that nobody else can get to. And we need the word of the Lord to get an accurate view of ourselves. Uh, one day, we're going to stand before the Lord. And it's important that we, that we realize that, that my prayer ought to be, Lord, show me the real me. Exactly right. That, that we, we need God to... It's not about, man, I... I hope the church is impressed with me. I, I, I hope they think a lot of me. I, I hope that, that, that I'm well-pleasing in the church's sight. Now, there is a balance of having the right testimony. This does not permission to, 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 to live in the way we want to, but ultimately, it ought to be, God, you know me. You know my thoughts. You know my struggles. You know my tendencies. Uh, Lord, you do that work in my life. Show me thy ways. Teach me thy paths. And, and we begin to serve God from the inside out. Amen. Our prayer ought to be, God, help me to please you, even if someone has the wrong view of me. There are times that people misunderstand our intentions. There are times that people misread you. There are times that, that people don't get it right. And it's not because they're judging you. They just, they don't see your heart. They don't know you all the way to the core. But God does. And that takes us to the next thing I want us to see. I wrote this statement down, written in the earth. Written in the earth. Look at verse number 11. Jeremiah 17, verse number 11. The Bible says, as the partridge sitteth on eggs and hatcheth them not. So he getteth them riches and not by right. Uh, and leave them in the midst of his days, at the end shall be a fool. Now, I had to look that up because the only partridge I know of is the partridge in a pear tree. So, someone say amen right there. But, but what I found out is that the partridge was the bird that it would actually sit on the eggs of other birds. And when those birds would hatch, it would recognize that this was not the parent and would not then stay with that bird. And so it is, those that get riches through dishonest means, they may sit on the egg, but it's ill-gotten gain, and it's not long-standing. It will not last. And so it's saying it like this, don't trust in riches and feel like that's, that, that's your security blanket. Your security will never be found in, in uh, what you have or what you've accomplished. Your security is only in Jesus. Oftentimes, many, many of Christians, they talk about their trials and their burdens, and trials aren't a bad thing. They help us keep our eyes on Jesus. When we've got so much going for us, when, when our health is just perfect, and, and when our money is great, and, and everything is just smooth sailing, it's so easy to get our eyes off Jesus and just look at what we have and be like, I'm good. It's all right. I'm, I'm going to make it. And, 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 and understand there's more to it than that. And, and it's important that the Bible teaches us. Uh, let's keep reading. I don't want to get stuck. Verse number 12. It says, a glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed. And they that depart from me shall be written in the earth, because they have forsaken the Lord, 
the fountain of living waters. And uh, it's so important that we, we talked about this, I believe it was chapter 2, when we talked about uh, uh, they wouldn't build cities unless there was a water source and how important it was to, to have that fountain of waters, that you didn't want that, 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 that uh, you, you, you couldn't build a city or you couldn't establish life without water. So it is, we need uh, the, the living water of God in our lives. We need the presence of God in our life. Uh, when you write a name in the earth, the next time the wind comes, that name is washed away or, or blown away, the, the whole point of that idea is when we forsake God, we live lives that have no eternal significance. Let me say it like this. If, if I was to go in, and it's just about down to Denise and I and a couple of kids, and, and we go to the beach, and we, you know, we, we, we take our shoes off, and, and, and we, we write a big heart in the sand, and, and then we, we write uh, KB plus DB forever and always. Uh, anybody ever wrote your name in the sand before? It's kind of fun, right? <laughs> Uh, uh, and then the waves come and wash it away. And it's like all your artwork is gone. Uh, that's what the Bible's talking about here. When you forsake God, it's all done. Washed away. Everything that you live for has no significance whatsoever. And as a nation, Israel has turned their back on God. And how sad it is. Let's keep going. I wrote this down. Preaching for an audience of one. An audience of one. Jeremiah's praying. Verse number 14. Jeremiah 17, verse 14. It says, Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved. For thou art my praise. He says, Lord, if you do the work, I know that it will be done. It's talking about the healing or the helping of his eternal soul. And I love this. Jeremiah says, you are my praise. I'm not just looking to you for blessings and answer prayer. Church, I feel like I'm, I'm rushing a little bit today. I know that I've got a plane to catch. And I apologize that I'm talking fast. But I want you to get this one thing. We need to make sure we're not just looking to God for blessings and answer prayer. He's more than that. He's bigger than that. He's our satisfaction. He's everything. Yes, he showers us with blessings every single day. But too often, we view God as a commodity. He's the dispenser of good things. And Jeremiah refused to stop there at his label of God. God, you're great because you're God. Keep in mind Nothing was going right in Jeremiah's life. He's soon going to be lowered into a pit. He's soon, there's going to be death threats on his life. Nobody listened to him. Everybody mocked him. And yet he's learning that it's God. I, I, I can promise you this. If you've ever been at a place of loneliness and were able to see God and say, God, I can't see my way out of the fog, but you are my praise. You are my hope. You are my stay. You are my rock. You are understanding a, a glimpse of what spiritual maturity is. Because we need to praise God even when his answer to your prayer is no. We need to praise God because his character never changes. Jeremiah 17, verse number 15. The Bible continues on. Behold, they say unto me, where is the word of the Lord? Let it come now. And so Jeremiah is preaching. And one of the ways by which people are responding, they're saying, where is it? When's it going to happen? This is all big talk. How come we're not being punished? When's the sky going to fall? When's my lightning bolt going to hit me? Verse number 16. As for me, I have not hastened from being a pastor to follow thee. Neither have I desired the woeful day that thou knowest. That which came out of my lips was right before thee. He says, I can't speak for their response, their skepticism. But I just, God wanted to follow you and preach your word 
and share your truth and, and, and share the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let them be confounded uh, uh, and that persecute me. Let me uh, not be confounded. Let them be dismayed, but let me not be dismayed. Bring upon them the day of evil and destroy them with the double destruction. Thus said the Lord unto me, go and stand in the gate of the children of the people, whereby the kings of Judah come in and by the which they go out, and in all the gates of Jerusalem. Remember, God already told Jeremiah to do this before, to go to the gate when the people are coming in and going out. He's saying this message is for everybody, for government, for leaders, for people, for, for all of them, and to show them the direction that they're going. Verse 20, I say unto them, Hear ye the word of the Lord, ye kings of Judah, and all Judah, and all inhabitants of Jerusalem that enter into the gates. Thus saith the Lord, Take heed to yourselves, and bear no burden on the Sabbath day, nor bring it in by the gates of Jerusalem. Neither carry forth a burden out of your houses on the Sabbath day. Neither do ye any work, but hallow ye your Sabbath day as I command your fathers." But they obeyed not, neither inclined their ear, but made their neck stiff, that they might not hear and receive instruction. It's important as we read this that, that we, we, we see God is saying to the people, the enemy is closing in on you. The problem is not the enemy. The problem is you. The problem is not Egypt. It's not Babylon. The problem is not Assyria. God is saying the problem is you. Get back to honoring the Lord. And he's talking here about the Sabbath day. For us, we recognize that we ought to honor the Lord all the time. The writer of Hebrews, it tells us that Jesus is the fulfillment of our rest. Our, our work could never accomplish in our salvation the finished work of God. So what do we do? We rest in Jesus because Jesus did it all. Uh, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin hath left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. And so the big work is salvation. And, and sadly, look at the response, verse number 23, and we'll wrap up with this. The Bible says, but they obeyed not, neither inclined their ear, but made their hearts stiff, that they may not hear nor receive instruction. And, and then it goes on to the judgment that they're going to deal with. And Again, the picture is the Sabbath day. For us, it's not about laws. It's not about a particular day of the week. It's about putting Jesus first. That in everything, he might have the preeminence. About making him number one. Again, that's our position today in life. For my daughters leaving in a few days, uh, it's putting God first. For you in your life today, it's putting God first. For students going back to school, putting God first. For you on the job site tomorrow, it's putting God first. For us, no matter where we are in life, it's putting God first. We must put God first, and that begins with salvation. Have you trusted Jesus Christ to save you? He did all the work. He paid the price for our sins on the cross. When we understand that, that salvation, Jesus did it all for us, then we can rest in him. We worship him. The reason we can praise, the, the reason we can sing of the goodness of God is because he's been faithful. You know what? I, I spend my life stubbing my metaphoric toe. I spend my life dashing my foot against a stone, Psalm 91. I spend my life making terrible decisions, and yet God is faithful, and God is there. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. That's the passage. Abide in Him. Trust Him and know Him. Let's bow our heads for prayer.